so I invite you to follow along from uh, Revelation uh, chapter 19. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven, shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute, prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen, Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both small and great. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Right blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, do not do it. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has his name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. May God's blessing be on the reading of his word this morning. I'm going to start this morning just by asking a simple question. How many of you saw the movie Titanic? All right, a few of you. So, so those of you who saw the movie, you cannot answer this question, all right? For those of you who did not see the movie, how did it end? <laughs> well, thinking grander scale than that. The Titanic sank, right? <laughs> the Titanic sank. And, and you know, honestly, uh, you really didn't have to see the movie to, to know, although I kind of expect it to be a quicker answer than that, right? You, you really didn't have to see the movie to know because it's a historical fact, the Titanic sank. Man's marvelous achievement, man's promise not only of a safe voyage over the sea, but the finer things of life, because it was promising all these finer things of life, man's unsinkable ship, because that's how it was deemed, right? For all the faith that man put in the Titanic, despite everyone's faith that they put in it, it sank. And I would wager that if you knew beforehand that the ship was going to go down, you most likely wouldn't have boarded, would you? You know, that's what they say, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? If only I knew today what I, or 
if only I knew then what I know, know today, right? Hindsight is twenty twenty. If they had known, if somebody had told them this ship is going to sink, that perhaps they wouldn't have boarded. Well, think of Revelation this way. Revelation is, in a sense, God's preview that the worldly system, whether you're calling it Babylon or Rome or the beast, because we've been talking about the symbol, uh, symbolic nature of each of these, uh, or some other name to talk about a kingdom other than God's kingdom, that's built on principles other than God's principles, uh, it will eventually go under and God's kingdom will come. So Revelation is kind of this preview. So think of it, some of the things we're reading in Revelation is like hindsight, right? We're getting to look back and say, ah, oh, that's how it's going to turn out. And in that sense, Revelation is giving encouragement to the faithful, uh, but it's also giving a warning to those who do not believe. This is where the ship is going, and this is how the end is going to be. So despite appearances of a fabulous voyage and the promise of riches and pleasure and, and the allure of all the extravagance of the Titanic and the fulfillment of, of dreams of all these people who, who boarded, if you climb aboard the worldly cruise liner, he says you're going to be sailing for a nightmare. And, and some of us, we might respond to that. We might be like, well, yeah, but... We heard, uh, I think it was Dan Moeller who said, yeah, but is our excuse for not obeying God, right? That's when we say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. A and it's usually an excuse to say, well, I, I know God says this, but I want to do this. Well, yeah, but the Titanic is a historical fact. We know the Titanic sank because it historically did. How do we know that revelation will come to pass? I mean, when we're looking at the future, how do we know that it's going to happen. Well, you know, the authenticity of the Bible has been established by many logical arguments. And, and uh, you know, I suppose we can do a lesson some, just sometime on the things that talk about why this book is special and why it's God's word. And we don't have time for that today. Uh, but one of the reasons why the Bible is uh, shown to be authentic is because when you look at it over and over again, its track record has been perfect in terms of fulfilled prophecies. Now, if I were to come up to Terry and I was going to say, you know, Terry, in one week, this is going to happen. And in one week, it happened. Wouldn't she be amazed? And, and I would come up and I'd say, you know, in another two weeks, you're going to see this happen economically, you know, whatever the case may be. And, and two weeks, and it happened. She's like, wow, he's doing pretty good. And I say, you know what's going to happen a month from now? And it happened just as I told her. You, th you think the next thing I told her, she's going to say, you know, well, I'm going to listen to this. But when you look at the scripture, it's happened just like that. Over and over again, you have all these prophecies that, that hundreds of years later were fulfilled over and over again. Now, if this book is batting a thousand on all other accounts, are you sure you want a question on the last one? If it's batting a thousand on all these other prophecies, do you want to gamble that in this one case uh, that it missed it? And that it's not going to happen the way that God's word has said it's going to be. Revelation is going to be encouragement for the believer. It's a call to the unbeliever to heed God's warning because he says, there are some ships that are heading for an iceberg and it may be just time to abandon ship because God wants to give us a lifeboat, doesn't he? God wants us to have a lifeboat. In fact, Revelation, uh, you know, kind of the image I was thinking of with this sermon was uh, we kind of see here a port call of two ships heading to two destinations. Uh, and the contrast really couldn't be any clearer as we've been thumbing through the pages. So uh, just kind of a, an overview of some of the place we've been and some of the comparisons. We've had the power of the beast, who's symbolic of the world power, right? The power of the beast who appears full of life. Who's, lead, who's going to be destroyed versus the saints who have been uh, under tribulation, who have experienced economic ruin, who have, have uh, suffered under the hands of the worldly system, who defeated through their death, because that's what Revelation talks about, right? Through their death, they overcame and were victorious in Christ. So that's one contrast. We see the exquisite linen of the prostitute who's condemned in, in chapter 17, with the fine linen of the bride who enjoys the wedding supper in chapter 19. We see in chapter 17 and 18 the fall of Babylon, or the world power, contrasted with the new Jerusalem. We haven't got there yet. It's in, in chapter 21. We see in chapter 18 over and over again, woe, woe to the great city. We're looking at an earthly perspective of all that's taking place. 
Chapter 19 is the same events that have taken place, but we're now looking at the heavenly perspective. So in chapter 18, you have all these people looking at the ruin and the destruction and, and the worldly system falling, and they're like, oh, woe is me, woe is me. Chapter 19 is the saints who are looking back and saying, God's kingdom is finally coming. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And they're looking at it from a heavenly perspective. So we see this contrast that's kind of taking place throughout because the way of the world promises hope, but it leads to ruin, whereas the way of God knows tribulation. Nowhere did Jesus say, if you follow me, you're going to have full pocketbooks. Life is going to be easy. You're going to have peace with everything. All your relationships will be nice and cozy. Nowhere does God promise that, does he? But he does say, in this world, you will have tribulation. And he does say, in this world, you will be persecuted for following me. He does say, if they treated me this way, they will treat those who follow me this way. You know, nowhere does he say that life will be a, a bed of roses, but he does say, in the end, you'll have hope and glory. So whereas chapter 18 kept saying, whoa, whoa, in chapter 19, we see that word that is mysteriously absent and the rest of scripture, that word of hallelujah. Hallelujah. So in verses one through eight, you know, as we, so that's kind of a, a little bit of an overview. In verses one through eight, we see this hallelujah chorus of uh, coming from the port of heaven. Hallelujah is an untranslated Hebrew word that simply means Praise Yahweh. Praise the Lord. That's what it means. Praise the Lord. So over and over again here in chapter 19, we're seeing praise the Lord. And, and we have this encounter with a great multitude. Remember, this is a multitude who has suffered under great tribulation. They've suffered at the hands of the world, not because they did wrong, but because they've been faithful to Christ. They suffered economically. They've suffered relationally. Some of them have suffered with the very giving of their lives all because they believed in Jesus Christ. And yet we come into chapter 19 and what's on their lips? It's not, God, I can't believe you let this happen to me. God, I can't believe you let me experience this. God, I can't believe how tough life was. The only thing that's on their lips is praise for God. Praise the Lord. They're exuberantly praising. You know, the glories of heaven outweigh any, any earthly trials. And, and arriving at the shore, the other shore, overshadows any rough seas along the way. Once we get to heaven, we're going to say, it was all worthwhile. It was all worthwhile. So when we, we come into Revelation 19, we see that we give praise to the Lord for who he is. And, and I want you to notice that the praise is not because the prostitute was condemned, but because in the act of condemning the prostitute, God is shown to be true and just. And so in, in uh, verses 1 and 2, he says, after this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven, shouting, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. So what we see here happening uh, is we see that uh, they're praising God for who he is as one is tr uh, just and true which we know by the fact that he has judged the great prostitute. We're praising him for who he is. You know, the judgment is a reflection of who God is, right? It's not that we're rejoicing that others have been judged because that's not the Christian way. And that's not God's heart either, is it? We're, rejo we're rejoicing in the fact that God is just and God is true. And because he is just and true, he had to judge evil. He had to judge injustice. He had to deal with sin. And, and as much as we may not like discussing judgment, and as much as I don't like to preach about the judgment side, a loving God cannot overlook all the evils of the world. I mean, turn on your, turn on your televisions, open up your newspapers. There is, there's evil, there's injustice, there's suffering, there's pain. There's all these things that sometimes make us want to cry out, and we just want to say, God, why? Why are you allowing all this to happen? There's a part of us that, that sometimes want to say, you know, I, I just don't understand why all the evil and all the suffering is there. And, and we just want to cry out, well, revelation is God's declaration. The day is coming that it will be dealt with. But for now, we can think of it this way. How many of you as parents would say that you can uh, love your children if you don't ever discipline them? 
the two go hand in hand, don't they? If you truly love them, you will discipline them because you care for them. And, and the same is true as we think about uh, the judgment and, and revelation, as we think about the holiness of God and the love of God, the two are, are intertwined. In fact, that's why we have the cross. You know, if God was, was just love and there was no sense of holiness, there would have been no need for the cross. God says, you know what? Evil, suffering, who cares? We'll just let it go. We'll just let it slide. Uh, we'll just bring them all in anyway. But the reason we have the cross is because God is both loving and he is holy. He is just. Somewhere sin had to be dealt with. And for the believer, we've said Jesus has dealt with sin and we want to accept what he has already done for us. But if we don't make that choice, the scriptures say somebody has to give an account for that sin. Uh, and, and so we want to praise God for who he is. He is just. He is true. There is a day when every wrong will be righted. Every evil will be dealt with. You know, uh, and, and we give him praise for that. And, and praise is simply telling God the reasons that we love him, isn't it? You know, sometimes, oftentimes we do it in song. But praise is simply saying, God, this is what we love about you. This is what we love about you. Now, if your praise is limited to what God does for us, then that's not truly love. It's a counterfeit, isn't it? I mean, otherwise, it's just about, well, I love God because of what he does for me. That's kind of why I was trying to point that out with the kids up here. I love God just because because what happens when, when we love God just for what he does for us is, well, when life isn't going as we expect, then all of a sudden we can't praise God anymore. In fact, we might question God altogether. Praise is, is loving God and telling God that we love him for who he is, not simply for what he does for us. Uh, last Tuesday, Amanda and I celebrated 19 years. Woohoo! right? We made it 19 years. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and I could say, you know, during those 19 years, we've had some ups, we've had some downs. Uh, we've had uh, days that we were in complete agreement with one another, and we've had days when... We were on completely different pages, right? Anybody can testify to that, right? You've been together for a while. Uh, but, you know, I could say I, I still love her, and, and not simply because of what she does for me. Though, though I've kind of quipped lately that cooking is nice, right? But it's not tied to what she does for me. And the same is true with God. It can't be tied to simply what God does for us but who God is. And, and if you're struggling to give God praise, then perhaps it's because you've lost sight of who God is as one who's worthy of all glory and honor and praise, regardless of whether we have everything we want in life. And perhaps we've forgotten what God has already done for us because of, regardless of what's happening today, his son paid the price for me on the cross. And perhaps if we're struggling to praise, we've also lost sight of what, what's in store for us in the future. Because all these things we give God praise for, right? For who he is, for what he's done, and for what he has yet to do. But sometimes we forget in the midst of, of what he has done and in the midst of what he has yet to do, we forget to give him praise simply for who he is. And so I want to ask you, is your praise tied to God's blessing or is your praise tied to God's character? Because we'd, we're not always going to understand life, are we? We're not always going to understand why we go through things we go through, why people we love and hold dearly go through the things that they go through. We're not always going to have uh, uh, answers to every question that we may have, but God's character doesn't change, and he's one who's worthy of our praise. So we want to praise him for who he is, and we want to praise him for what he has done. From heaven's shore, it will be easy to look back because we have hindsight and, and marvel at all the things that God has done. And he says, salvation and glory and power belong to our God in verse 2. And what he in fact is saying is God gets all the credit. God gets all the credit. It, it's been said that when we get to heaven, there'll be three surprises. One surprise will be we'll see some people there that we didn't expect to see. Another surprise will be we won't see some people there that we expected to see. And the third surprise will be that we're actually there, right? Because when we get to heaven, we'll realize we really didn't deserve this. We really didn't deserve it. There'll be no place for boasting. It won't be, look at me, look what I achieved. 
It won't be, look at all the things I did for God's kingdom. We'll realize that we're standing there solely because of the grace and the mercy of God. It belongs to him. All credit goes to him. You know, Babylon promises a false salvation. Babylon gives a facade of glory. Babylon gives this appearance of power, and it kind of entices many to come on board. I mean, who wouldn't have wanted to board the Titanic, the unsinkable ship on its maiden voyage? But on the final day, what he says is Babylon will be revealed for what it is, perishing. Just as the Titanic was revealed for what it was, sinkable. Despite how everybody felt about it at its time. And so we see Babylon is judged for her immorality, she's judged for her idolatry, and she's judged for how she treated God's people. That's what he says at the end of verse 2, how God has avenged. And he says, God's judgments are true and just. This is something we've seen throughout the book of Revelation. Every lie is exposed, every motive is revealed, every wrong is righted, as God will act out of who he is. A loving God but also a holy and just God. You know, I think we would all be honest to say sometimes we've, we've looked around and we've wondered, haven't we? You, you look at the newspapers, you see the suffering, you see the evil, you know, that, that, that question that people ask so often, well, if God is all loving and God is all powerful, then why is there evil and why is there suffering and, and why is there since such injustice and why is there such sin? And people question, don't they, how, how good and, and all-powerful God can allow some of these things to go on. But Revelation gives us that assurance. It says, he has avenged the blood of his servants in verse 2. So from our perspective, we're kind of looking at these things, and we're seeing them, and we don't have answers to the questions. But from heaven's perspective, as we look back, we're going to see that hindsight, that God has an answer for all the evil. God has an answer for all the injustice. God has an answer for all the sin and all the wrongs and, and that he will be proven to be just and true in the end. Remember, Revelation is kind of like God's preview. He's kind of showing us uh, a picture uh, and, and helping us to see where all these things are heading. We got God's movie trailer for all those who like to check out your movie trailers all the time. For all the questions of evil and suffering, Revelation gives us God's definitive answer and the assurance that there will be victory for God's people. So once again, we see encouragement for the believer and warning to the unbeliever that everything will be dealt with in the end. Now granted, it may not happen in our time frame, and that's where we wrestle, isn't it? Because by golly, we want stuff and we want it now. In fact, we usually want it yesterday. We're not very patient people, are we? We're not very patient at all. It's not going to happen in our time frame. But that doesn't mean God is indifferent. And that doesn't mean that God is incompetent. All it means is that God is wiser than we are. And is that really so hard to believe? God is wiser in his time. And he knows best. Uh, but, but the wondrous thought that I see here, remember these people that are giving praise to God in chapter 19 are the very ones who have just gone through this tribulation, the very ones whose blood has been shed for their faith in Jesus Christ, the very ones who have suffered economically because they wouldn't compromise their faith, the very ones that didn't fit into their society because they held true to Jesus Christ and they wouldn't give in to the beast. They are the very ones that are standing now before God in his beauty and his wonder and his majesty, and there's no sign of regret, there's no indication of this is what I gave my life for. But there is a full sign of praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we praise him for who he is and what he's done, and we also praise him for what is yet to come. In verse 6, we see it says, uh, uh, talks about the beginning of God's reign. Uh, it says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. And, and it's not in the sense that, that God hasn't always been reigning, but, but what do we pray every week? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's not as if God hasn't been on the throne all along, but there is 
a, a new plan that's coming into place. There's a, a restoration of creation, isn't there? Uh, and, and we're talking about when God's kingdom will reign on earth as it is in heaven. So we have this beautiful thing to look forward to. Uh, as well as this greater intimacy with the Lord, we get into the language of the wedding supper of the Lamb and about the bride being made ready. And, and in fact, R.C. Spohr writes that Revelation is not about an ending as much as a new beginning. How many times do we look at Revelation and we think about the end of the world? And we forget about the fact that Revelation ends with a new world and a new heaven, doesn't it? It's not so much about the ending, it's about a new beginning, about what God has in store for his people, about what God has intended from the very beginning of time, about the relationship that is to be had with him. So we see that the bride has made herself ready, and that kind of transitions into the sharing of the wedding supper of the lamb. Uh, and, and we see, uh, you know, symbolism can be kind of loose at times. So one sense we're the bride, and then a couple verses later it talks about the guests that have been invited to the wedding supper. Uh, so we see the kind of that metaphor that's running through. Uh, but the bride has made herself ready. Now there's nothing as painstaking as a bride preparing for her wedding day, right? You women can speak of that, can't you? How many weddings have started late because the bride wasn't ready yet? But, but all those events, all those details coming up to the wedding day, and we have to have our gowns and our hair and our jewelry, and oh, man, it just, you ladies, very painstaking, isn't it, to get ready for your wedding day? The bride is made ready. Now, what does it say here about the bride has been made ready? It says in verses 7 and 8, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Fine linen is described as the righteous acts of the saints. Now, some of you might be thinking, but I thought we were saved by grace. Here it says she's made herself ready with this fine linen, which is righteous acts. Doesn't that sound like salvation by works? Well, if you pay attention to the language, it's very interesting. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. It was both given to her and then something that she has done. In fact, what we're looking at in this verse is the clothing is given to us, and it's also a reflection of deeds done, because what they're saying is what, the good that I've done is because of the grace of God in my life. It's not that I've been prepared because I've done all these good things to earn God's favor. What it's talking about is because I've received the grace of God, because God's spirit has come into my life, then God's grace and God's spirit in me has produced these good works. Does that make sense? It's what God has done in my life. Remember, all the credit goes to him. Even the good that I've done is a reflection of the grace of God that is in me and, and, and the power and the motivation to do good, that comes from, from God himself. So, so this clothing was given to me and because of the faith and the grace that I've received that was given to me, that has poured itself out in the righteous deeds that God has called me to do. The order is very important. It's not works and then grace. It's grace and then that flows through in the works that I do. Now, if you think about the wedding metaphor, it's, there's a beauty to it. Because the, the wedding metaphor and the Jewish had three different stages to it. So the first stage was the betrothal, which was more serious for them than our engagement is today. In fact, the betrothal could only be broken by, uh, by a divorce. It wasn't officially married, but it could only be broken by divorce. And unfaithfulness during the betrothal was, was the same thing as committing adultery. That's how seriously they took betrothal. That's where we see with Mary and Joseph, they were betrothed together uh, before, you know, before she was pregnant with Jesus, right? And so, so, so you might think of betrothal as that point in our life that we say, I believe Jesus is Lord and I receive him into my life. And, and that act of betrothal is a promise to be faithful until the wedding day. Okay, so it's a promise. And, and that's what we do when we confess Christ and when we're baptized, right? We're promising to be faithful to him throughout life. Now, the second stage 
uh, for the Jewish people was we have the betrothal. The second point of the wedding was when the groom would come back for the bride. Think about Jesus' return. That's what we're talking about. The, br the, br the groom would come back for the bride, and then the third was the wedding feast, which could last for days. They knew how to party better than we do, I guess, right? So we have this picture in, in the wedding. We've, we've, we've shown ourselves faithful to Christ. We've made that decision for Christ. We've shown faithful. He's come back for his church, and he's brought us back to the wedding feast. That's the picture we have taking place here in Revelation 19. Because we've been faithful, because we haven't broken that covenant, because we, we've received that grace and we've lived out in that grace, he's come back for his people and he's brought us to share in the marriage feast of the Lamb. That's why they're singing hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now verses 11 through 21, they kind of continue with uh, two ships and two destinations depending on who we're sailing with. Or, or in other words, who we're following, whether it's uh, Jesus or the worldly system. And, and some see in these final verses the second coming of Jesus, uh, along with the millennial reign, uh, the thousand-year reign. And, and I'm not going to talk about that today because that's the content of chapter 20. Others have argued that it's not so clear that this is the second coming uh, because there's a lack of some of the details that are usually associated with that. For instance, we don't see Jesus coming on the clouds. Uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and so they say, well, the focus of these verses isn't the return of Jesus for the church as much as this battle with the enemy that's going to take place. Uh, but what we do see, we, whichever way you look at it, is we see a revelation of Jesus as a conquering king. We see Jesus as a righteous judge. And we see Jesus as the captain of, of heaven's armies. We see Jesus as faithful and true in contrast to the beast. We might also notice the, the weapon is the sword of mouth. We've seen this in Revelation already. Uh, reflection of the word of God. Uh, truth will destroy lies and so on. We see his eyes are blazing fire. Uh, we saw this in the, I think it was chapter 1 as, of Revelation as well, right? Uh, nothing is going to miss his gaze. Uh, his judgment is going to be pure. You know, if I see something, my eyes can deceive me, right? In fact, they often do. I, I walk into the house, and I, and I see something, and I jump to judgments because I know what's been taking place, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? And, you know, sometimes I miss it. That's not true with Jesus. His eyes are blazing. He sees. He sees the motivations. He sees the intentions. He sees the actions. There's nothing undisclosed to him. That's why his judgments can be pure and just uh, all the way. Uh, we see uh, the... Uh, um, he has many crowns reflecting his royalty and supremacy as he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so regardless of how one may interpret these final verses in this chapter, you cannot miss the fact that it emphatically declares the evil will be overthrown and that Christ and those with him will be victorious. And so we have reason to praise. We have reason to praise. You know, God and, and the world are both calling, and they're both kind of shouting out to us. They're saying, all aboard. Sounds more like a train than a ship, but I've never been on a cruise, right? So I'm assuming it's something similar. You know, all aboard. But the truth is you can't occupy both ships. And your destination depends on which choice of captain that you make. And, and you can trust your eyes which look at the world that seems unsinkable, that promises luxury and pleasure, but is destined to sink, leaving you as fish bait. He used, fish, uh, he used birds in this text, but according to this metaphor, fish bait, right? Uh, or you can trust through faith in the God who's proven himself faithful throughout time, whose fingerprints are all over creation, who has revealed his power and glory through the raising of Christ crucified. And the challenge that always faces us is when you're looking at thy Titanic and, and you're looking at all the luxury it affords, and, and, and then on the other hand, you see this rickety old fishing boat being piloted by a lowly carpenter named Jesus. Because that's really what it kind of looks like, doesn't it? The first seems to offer a smoother ride, but it's destined to sink, while the second may encounter some rough seas. In fact, you're sure to experience the waves a little bit more in the second, right? 
but it guarantees safe voyage all the way to the other side. You know, in these final verses, there are no details to the battle. Isn't that interesting? Uh, you know, Hollywood wouldn't know what to do with this chapter because you have the battle and it's gone and it's done just like that. There's no details to the battle itself, just the aftermath. So Hollywood wouldn't have anything to work with because the outcome has already been decided. It was over before it ever began because as it turns out, Jesus was more than a carpenter. He was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so in him, we will always have reason to praise if indeed we've come aboard with him. And you know, wh whatever response you make to Jesus, it doesn't change who he is. He is the king of kings and Lord of lords. So my only thing for us today is, have we accepted him as such in our own life? Are we allowing him to reign in our lives as such, as the king of kings and Lord of lords? Have we turned our lives over to him in such a way that we can say we're on his ship and he's the captain and we're going wherever he leads. Amen. I'd like to say at this point, and you're